Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's uh, meeting of the Portsmouth Planning Board. It's August 6, 2009, and um, I'd like to open the public hearing. This is a public hearing convened to solicit public comment on dra draft revised zoning ordinance dated June 11, 2009, and the draft revised site plan review regulations dated April 24, 2008. Um, copies of these documents are available for public inspection in the planning department, the public library, and on the city website. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to, to uh, Rick Tainter to um, get us started with some um, review of the process. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do a, a presentation. I've, uh, the previous two public hearings have, the presentation has run a little bit long, and so I've tried to cut it down some, but I'm going to just give some background about the, uh, the zoning ordinance uh, changes, that right, how we got to where we are, and some of, the major, um, uh, some of the major changes that are being proposed. Also, uh, I've handed out a, a one-page list of comments that were received at the last two public uh, hearings, and I'll talk a little about, a bit about them at the very end of the, um, of the presentation. But we will be, as we take comments um, here and on the web and written and on the phone, however they come in, uh, we will be adding to this, and that will serve as a, uh, a uh, kind of a checklist for the planning board um, as they review the, the draft after the end of the public hearings. Um, just a, a little bit about the scope of what we're doing. Um, we're talking primarily about the revised zoning ordinance. Um, the, the zoning ordinance uh, has district regulations which address uses that are allowed and prohibited uh, or that might be allowed by special exception or conditional use permit. Uh, they include environmental protection standards and historic, pre historic preservation requirements, uh, issues relating to site development such as parking, uh, loading, signs, outdoor lighting, and so forth. And then there are some changes, uh, considerable changes in the ordinance relating to uh, format and structure of the ordinance, uh, the way it appears, the way it's organized, and uh, the number of terms that are defined and how they're uh, shown in the ordinance. Uh, but then in addition to the zoning ordinance, the other half of that is the zoning map, which actually shows where the zoning districts and the overlay districts are. We're proposing some new districts, uh, a new district called the Gateway District, which is um, we'll replace some business zoning along some of the major corridors coming into the city, um, and we're, we're coming up with a new concept of sign districts that are distinct from the uh, use districts. And then there, there will be boundary changes to existing districts uh, that will be proposed. And the planning board is going to have a workshop um, on, on the zoning map changes, on, on some zoning map changes, at the beginning uh, of their regular uh, meeting, or before their regular meeting on uh, August 20th. That'll be the, 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 really the first time they've looked at, at uh, zoning map changes altogether. Then beyond the zoning, there are the uh, site plan review regulations, which are planning board regulations that address how um, a specific development uh, is laid out on the site and looks at impacts such as traffic and, and um, uh, stormwater and, and so forth. And then there will be uh, required changes to other ordinances. Uh, there will be changes to the, uh, that the city, city council would have to adopt uh, in order to make the, the zoning changes uh, effective. That would be including um, changing the uh, current uh, authorization for site plan review to uh, extend down to three and four unit structures. It currently only applies to five units and more. And, um, looking at some of the performance standards that overlap between city ordinances and zoning ordinances and looking at the planning board ordinance. Um, just as background, the last major revision of the zoning ordinance was in 1995. Since that time, there have been many incremental uh, changes, many of which had responded to specific issues that came up at, at a time, and, and so a, a zoning change was made to respond to that. And as a result, there have been many layers of changes over time. Um, there have been some federal and state laws that have come into play in the last few years that, that uh, require changes in the zoning ordinance to conform to that. And there have been some recent changes that have been, have been adopted independently uh, in the zoning ordinance uh, before, just before and while this, this uh, process has been going on. Some of the objectives of, of doing this study and this, this uh, process of revising the zoning ordinance and the site plan review regulations, uh, a key one was to implement uh, the recommendations of the master plan, which was 
completed in 2005 and uh, had a number of land use and zoning recommendations. Um, sustainability, uh, environmental sustainability was a, was a key uh, theme in that uh, master plan, and so there have been added provisions in the zoning ordinance to address that, although they're not all in one place. They're somewhat spread throughout the ordinance and through the site plan review regulations. Uh, one, of the, one of the other um, objectives is to balance maybe some in increased flexibility to, so we're not um, stuck in a, in a particular direction that doesn't make sense. But to, but to make sure there's predictability of how the ordinance plays out. And we've tried to, tried to provide some alternatives in the ordinance uh, that are, that are uh, the, there are two different ways in some cases that a, a person could develop <coughs> on a particular site. Um, balancing resource protection with private property and, and economic development. Using common sense. I mean, as we've gone through the ordinance, we've found many uh, areas that um, maybe at one time they made, made sense, conditions have changed. Maybe they're just hard to interpret right now. So we've tried to make this uh, a co more common sense ordinance and to make it more user friendly so that more people can understand it. It's, it's a very difficult ordinance to follow in some places right now. Uh, we started the process in April of 2006. So it's been over uh, three years that we've been working on the project. Uh, we've had uh, over 45 meet meetings with the planning board, uh, eight city council work sessions or meetings, a dozen meetings with other municipal boards. <coughs> And during this whole this time, we've also been continuing to receive referrals from the from the city council. Whenever a uh, zoning change is proposed to the city council or requested, the city council has to refer it to the planning board um, under under our ordinances. And so a number of those have gone through. There was a workforce housing uh, uh, zoning proposal that was done uh, around the Atlantic Heights affordable housing proposal. There was a non-residential plan unit development proposed. Um, uh, on, uh, on Lafayette Road opposite Elwyn Park. There was a proposal to uh, ban or, or control formula businesses, chain businesses in the downtown area that, that didn't get adopted. Um, there was a, um, we, we looked at changing the building height regulations in the, in the Central Business A District. And then the big one, which is ongoing right now, is the senior housing proposal, which uh, came, uh, I think, it initially in 2007, and it's been moving along somewhat slowly, and it, and it has actually come to the point where we're, we're looking at them together as part of this overall revision of the ordinance, but they came on, on two separate tracks. Uh, we uh, finished our draft site plan review regulations in April of 2008, and our draft zoning ordinance in, in June of 2009, and, and that's where we're, what we're reviewing now. Um, some major uh, changes just in terms of format and structure of the ordinance. Uh, we consolidated uh, the table of use regulations. There were separate tables for, for different groups of zoning districts, and we tried to combine them all together, and that helped us to see inconsistencies between the districts because there were different terms used in different sections of the ordinance. And so putting those together helped us to see the inconsistencies, resolve them, and it also helped us to update uh, the ordinance to see do we really mean uh, that this use should be prohibited in this district but be allowed by special exception in that district. So. Uh, that was a major task, just grouping that all together. Um, combined all the dimensional standards in one section. They were spread in different sections of the, of the ordinance. All the overlay districts, uh, the historic district, the um, uh, floodplain district, um, the downtown overlay district, the, uh, uh, the Osprey Landing district. These are all districts that overlay on top of, of the, the basic residential, commercial, industrial districts, and we grouped all those in one area uh, where they were spread in different sections of the ordinance before. Um, there, were sub there were some supplemental use regulations, and some of them were in one section of the ordinance. Some of them were interspersed with the use regulations. We tried to pull those out and, and distinguish them from the use regulations. And a major piece was just going through and defining terms to be more precisely so that we could, um, so we could actually use them uh, more efficiently in the ordinance. Some substantive changes, uh, those, those were really a format and, su and structure, and some substantive ones, and some of the key ones are this gateway district that's being proposed along uh, Lafayette Road, which I'll talk about in some detail in a little bit. Um, it's a strategy for the business corridors, and it could be used in other parts of the city. Right now, the initial proposal is to look at it uh, for Lafayette Road. Um, this continuing care retirement community, uh, which, is, um, which is proposed for the area between Borthwick Avenue and, and uh, Islington Street, that, as I mentioned before, that was a city council referral that, um, uh, we, that was given to the planning board. And, Planning staff and planning board have been working um, with the uh, develop, proposed developer 
um, trying to work out a, an ordinance that would meet the city's needs as well as the, the uh, original intent of the proposal. Uh, in wetlands, uh, we've expanded the jurisdictional areas covered by the wetlands ordinance and added performance standards relating to uh, site uh, stormwater management and vegetation management and buffer zones. Uh, we've very significantly changed the downtown parking standards and the options available. And as I mentioned before, we've, we've, we've um, come up with the idea of sign districts as a better way to, a way that might help us uh, manage signs better. Now, the gateway district, um, as we're now as we're now conceiving of it, um, would take the existing general business district, uh, but uh, general business and office research districts between the Rye Town Line and the Route One bypass. So, um, here's this is the town line, and it's this light blue area along Lafayette Road, and this, this is where the bypass is up in this area. Uh, here's Sagamore Creek coming across, and the Urban Forestry Center and the Industrial Park, and so forth. Um, and the objectives of this are to encourage mixed-use development. Right now, the, these districts do not allow residential dis, uh, development, and they really tend to segregate uses, and they result in a, um, a typical suburban strip kind of development. So the idea is to encourage mixed use, mixing of residential and commercial development, uh, to enhance the character of the, of, the, of the corridor development and redevelopment, um, to allow for expansion of moderate-cost housing just by allowing uh, uh, some multifamily housing to be incorporated, to incorporate pedestrian bicycle access and circulation, and to use the existing transportation infrastructure, the roadway system, uh, efficiently. And this is a, a series of photos that, um, and a visualization that was done by a firm called Urban Advantage that does this all across the country. And it's done for a city in, in Illinois. And there, we had many versions of this, but many of them seem to be from the southwest and the and the West, and this one seemed to be more um, of the idea of what we might envision the, an evolution for, for Lafayette Road. So, so this, this existing condition is a, a typical urban uh, low-density corridor, and then you'll see a series of changes that are uh, photo simulations that um, basically simulate how either the city could make a change in the corridor or how zoning could make a change. And the first one, which is always the easiest to do on on a photo and very difficult to do in real life is taking down the overhead wires. Um, so that was undergrounding utilities just makes it look a whole lot better to begin with. But then doing some landscaping, uh, putting some landscaping in um, just to do some sh a little bit of buffering of the edge of the road um, is, is, is shown as another, as another first step. But then you start looking at the zoning and how you might allow, um, let's go back a second, is, you, know, you see in this area there's a very low um, suburban type building and just bringing something that's a little bit more um, character defining into the into the uh, strip um, improves the character and one of the things that came out of the one of the themes that was in the master plan process was making the rest of Portsmouth as special as the downtown and this could really begin to to get at that um, again bu building bringing buildings closer to the street uh, shielding parking making it more pedestrian friendly um, and and then incorporating transit all of these things are, are things that can be done with a combination of public investment and, um, and zoning. Zone, zoning has to uh, allow things to happen, and it has to um, encourage things uh, that you want to have happen. happen. One of the, a really good example of this in New England of how this process can happen is a place called Mashpee Commons on Cape Cod, which was an old shopping center. It was a really run-down shopping center, and a developer came in and basically redeveloped it as a more urban type of area. So... Um, the, the, this is the, the, sh the shopping center with the supermarket before it was redone. And this is what it's like today. And the that supermarket is still there, but it's been kind of wrapped around by a nice walkable community. And, and that type of thing with, urban, with development and in urban infill can really uh, improve the character of, of this type of area. This is the Gateway District. Um, just to kind of orient you, we've got uh, Walmart and uh, Southgate Plaza, Water Country, Market Basket, the old Yokens. There are a lot of fairly large sites in this area, and they, they will eventually be redeveloped, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in a few years. But if we have the zoning in place to allow the right type of redevelopment, uh, we'll be ahead of the game. So in, the, in this uh, proposed gateway district, we have uses that are allowed and uses that would be allowed by conditional use permit. And the allowed uses would be based on the existing regulations in the general business district, 
But the key thing is that the front yards would be reduced. Right now, there's a 105-foot front setback required along Lafayette Road, and it was partly for to, to move buildings back from the street and partly to make way for a, an eventual widening of Lafayette Road. But we've talked to the state engineers, and they're thinking about a, a long-term, consistent 92-foot cross-section for Lafayette Road. So that helps us define how far, how close we can get buildings to the road. And so we've we're, we're defining a, uh, a much smaller min, uh, front yard, minimum front yard and actually having a maximum front yard to encourage parking to be behind um, that front yard. And, then, and, and that in and of itself would help to improve the, the character of redevelopment. But uh, the conditional use permit, which is being called a gateway plan development, uh, it would be an optional use within the gateway district. Um, it would allow a mix of residential, in a, residential uses if they're in a mixed-use development, not residential by itself, but residential as part of a mixed-use development. A further reduction of the front yard, a greater, greater coverage of the lot, and uh, the incentive for, for, for planned development, for allowing that, um, uh, the, uh, the, the development to be, be of a higher quality is, is the additional development potential that, that might happen. Um, the next, I guess, major change, the most significant change is, is what we're looking at in the downtown parking uh, system. Um, that, that system, the current system, was adopted in 1997, um, and its purpose was to promote shared parking in garages and to discourage individual lots that would break up the streetscape of the downtown area. They basically, in a, in a downtown, because it's such a walkable area, you want to have uh, central, central or, or grouped facilities, shared facilities, where people can get out of their cars and walk around rather than requiring each uh, lot to provide its own parking. Um, and, and that worked uh, for many years, but it, there are some challenges. Um, one of the challenges is that we're still, whenever a project comes in, we still have to go back and look at all the way back to 1997 to see what was on the lot at that point. It's, it's, a, it's a convoluted ordinance. It's becoming increasingly complex as multi-tenant buildings get redeveloped and retenanted and, and so forth. It's very hard to, to um, implement. And it's very hard to understand uh, by, by the kind of a normal person. Um, so we've been looking at, at revisions for, for um, a long time. The uh, Economic Development Commission has been involved in studying this for, for many great. years. And um, every, just, every thing that we do is going to be a tough, th a tough thing to do, but we think it's time to, to bite the bullet and move ahead with that. So in terms of there, there are really three elements to what we're proposing as far as downtown parking. One is modifying the parking regulations uh, downtown to better reflect downtown parking demands. Uh, people, you don't need as many parking spaces, perhaps, per square foot in a downtown area as you do at a shopping mall because uh, you have people, multiple users of spaces, people, as I mentioned before, people getting out of their cars and walking around rather than driving from business to business. Um, the, the second thing is, is the uh, updating the in-lieu fee amount. Right now, there's a, there's a provision that allows and enc really encourages um, a developer to pay an in-lieu fee in, in lieu, a, a fee in lieu of, of actually providing the parking spaces, but that fee is so low that it is a very, very tiny percentage of the actual cost of providing parking. So uh, we're recommending that that be updated to represent a larger share of the cost of providing public spaces. And then the in-lieu fee calculation, and, and basically one, it's one word, it's simplify. It's, it's, it's become so complicated, as I, as I said, um, so we've tried to simplify that. In terms of modifying the parking regulations, the one thing we're, do, we're proposing is that we eliminate any parking, any parking requirement at all for a first floor use other than a restaurant use. And that's because those are the uses that really are, uh, restaurant uses do generate a lot of parking demand, but other uses are the uses that really uh, depend on people walking around the downtown, popping into stores, and so forth. And so those, those can be uh, served by the, by the on-street spaces, by the garage spaces, by the surface lot spaces. And, and so they, we really don't need to um, apply a parking requirement for them. Um, the second part of it is to standardize parking requirements based on floor area. Right now we have, if, depending on how you use the upper floor of a building, uh, if you use it for a residential use, you'd have one parking requirement. If you use it for an office use, you'd have a different one. And it's just, just to simplify this, uh, we're, we're looking at, at making that a standard um, uh, parking requirement uh, based on square footage. And then the final thing is to deduct, to deduct the first four spaces, after we've gone through the whole calculation, to deduct the first four spaces. And the intent of that is to really uh, avoid um, 
hurting a small a small property owner. And, and again, the small properties are really the uh, the lifeblood of a town of a downtown like Portsmouth, um, and something that's the equivalent of a of a uh, two-family house or maybe a 1,000 square foot office um, or commercial building. Um, it, it's very hard for them to perhaps. Uh, provide parking on site because often these lots are very small and the building covers the entire site or to or to pay a, a substantial fee so that's so all in all we're, this would reduce uh, parking requirements overall and specifically reduce it for the smallest users then the second part is to update and simplify the fee and um, one aspect of this is that we are proposing that on site uh, parking for new residential development be required that there shouldn't be an in lieu fee because those are the spaces that when a snow emergency comes and it's hard to find spaces and the garage is full, uh, that's where you, where you run into problems with the, the residents who've just moved into downtown and have no place to park. So, uh, and, and that does create the congestion in those situations. So we're proposing that as a, as a significant change. We're also proposing to increase the, the in lieu fee so that it ultimately represents 40 to 50 percent of the cost of providing a parking space. And this sort of it leads toward the idea of uh, equal cost sharing between the the um, local government and the, the private developer. And then to eliminate that 1997 baseline computation, the total parking threshold uh, that is we have to always look back at when we're doing these computations, and just to look at any increase in parking demand as of the time we're, we're looking at it, not, not backing into a, a, a 1997 figure that has no relevance anymore. And this, um, one of the things that we're looking at here also is um, pulling back the area within which this, uh, this in lieu fee can be used. Right now it is the existing central business district which goes all the way down uh, Islington Street down to the park. Uh, as, as you can see down here, this very narrow neck of the central business district. And we're proposing to actually make it be equivalent to the downtown overlay district which was adopted a few years ago, which is outlined here uh, in sort of a black and white outline and it's then shaded in on this, on this map. And it just, it's just a slightly smaller version of the same area, but it's, it's, it's the area that is most uh, closely served by the public parking facilities. Another one, another big um, change in the ordinance which uh, is generating a lot of interest is the continuing care retirement community proposal. And I mentioned before that came through as a referral from the city council. Um, it's a, it's a new use that's being defined in the zoning ordinance. Um, it's, it's called a continuing care retirement community. And it in, it's defined so that it includes independent living units, assisted living units, and skilled nursing care units. It has to have all three of those. And the, and the idea is that, it's, that it um, allows you to move from one to another as, as life situations change. And the, um, the, the ordinance, the proposed ordinance, uh, would allow these by a conditional use permit from the planning board. And, and as I mentioned, it's, it must contain all three types of units. Um, currently, the, the current ordinance um, is a, uh, specifies that it has to be in an office research district uh, within a half a mile of the hospital and at least 35 acres on one or more lots. And the, um, the half mile radius is this inner circle here. Um, and the, uh, uh, this, the area that's, I'm not sure that you can see it, but these, these the yellow areas are the areas that are office research zone parcels. Uh, the red area, the pink area is the hospital. Sorry about that. And um, the, uh, there's an outlined area right in here which is the current proposal for Borthwick Village. So that gives you the idea of what a 35 acre site is like in that area. Um, there are computations where, where uh, there's a certain amount of developable land area required for each type of dwelling unit. Um, maximum height is set at 50 feet, except that if you're less than 150 feet from a residential district, it, you can only be three stories or 40 feet in order to minimize the, or to reduce the impact on the adjoining residential areas. Um, the setbacks are 50 feet from a parcel boundary, 100 feet from a residential district, um, requiring at least 40% of the developable area to be uh, usable open space, and any areas within 100 feet of a residential district to be a vegetated buffer area. So we're, we're recognizing there's a larger scale development and that if it goes in there, it, it needs to be developed in such a way that it uh, protects uh, an adjoining area from any impacts. These are uh, not the proposed buildings, but these are examples of this type of development and the scale that we're talking about, four to five story buildings um, 
It can be all sorts of different building styles, and these are just several examples from various places actually in Massachusetts. And, and this is the site plan of the proposed development. We've had many hearings and, or many hearings and workshops um, on the development itself and on that proposal, and we're just now uh, folding that proposal into the overall zoning um, ordinance revision. In terms of resource protection, sustainability, and specifically wetlands protection, we have um, made changes in the, uh, in the wetlands section to expand coverage. Uh, right now, under the existing ordinance, a wetland is only um, covered if it is, uh, it's only jurisdictional if it's uh, half an acre or more. And the propose, proposal is to reduce that threshold to 10,000 square feet, uh, basically cutting about a, about a quarter of an acre, so cutting the jurisdictional size in half. And that sounds like it would be a, um, a significant change, but on this map, um, it may be hard to see, but this, these shaded areas are the areas that are currently jurisdictional. Uh, they're, they're either wetlands areas or buffer areas uh, using the half acre rule. And then there are darker, they almost look like dark blue dots through here. And those are the additional uh, wetlands that are that are, would be would be brought in if by by reducing that jurisdictional threshold to ten to ten thousand square feet, and the reason that you don't see that much is many of those areas are already within the buffer areas of larger of the larger uh, districts, and then we're adding vernal pools in, uh, which are important for amphibians, and most, again most of those are in wetlands as well. But and if you could see this more clearly, a, these are little red dots. There's one there and one there, and there are a couple of others, but there there aren't there are very few that are not already covered. Uh, by the existing ordinance. But the important thing is that we're recognizing a smaller um, threshold. Uh, many agencies even recommend a smaller threshold, uh, but, but this is a, uh, I felt a, a good place for Portsmouth to be in terms of its regulations. And then we've um, added in some best management practices for stormwater and for and some vegetation management areas within the buffer areas around wetlands just to further protect the wetlands. In terms of sign regulations, um, sign, signage is a very difficult uh, thing to, uh, to regulate. Um, it's very important and it's very, it's, it has, it's very complex. We deal with different types of signs, whether they're hanging, projecting, freestanding, flat against the wall, on a roof, whatever. Uh, the area of the sign, um, the height of the sign and, and, how, and setback from the sidewalk or the building or the, or the, uh, or the street. And, Sign illumination, whether you have internally illuminated signs, externally illuminated signs, neon signs. So there are many, many different aspects. And what we've, what we've done is we've tried to create, we've, we've, we, our approach is to create some sign districts. And we've created, defined on a preliminary way, six uh, groups of areas that would be each individually sign, sign, sign districts. And within those, uh, we have tables that set forth uh, sign types that are allowed, sign areas that are allowed, um, height and setback, and the different types of illumination that would be allowed. And so this makes it easier to look at in the same way that by combining all the use tables made it easier to look at, at comparing use regulations. This makes it easier to, to see whether we're doing what we mean to do with the sign regulations. Um, in terms of the zoning map, um, the, we have some zoning map changes that we've identified already and, and more that we're working on. One of the key ones that uh, I, th I think is very important is along Islington Street. I mentioned that right now the Central Business District extends down to the park. Uh, then we have this uh, apartment, apartment district uh, which in a light yellow that uh, is on both sides of Islington Street but, but has only one block wide or a few houses wide as it crosses. And then there's a mixed residential uh, business district and then the business district down by uh, Plaza 800 and Sherwin-Williams and Button Factory and all that area. And so what we're proposing to do is to to bring the central business district back up toward about, just about to the client's furniture. And obviously Klein's is, is a place we're choosing because that's already in, in the development process. It doesn't make sense to try to include that and make that non-conforming. So we're, we're stopping at that area. And, and then we're proposing to bring this existing mixed residential business district up the rest of, of Islington Street. And, what that does is it, it has a lower uh, allowed height. Uh, instead of having a 60-foot allowed height, we're down to a 40-foot allowed height, uh, with this adjoining residential neighborhoods being a 35-foot height. Um, it has f fewer intense uh, commercial uses allowed, um, uses that would tend to be disruptive to a neighborhood. Uh, and, um, it, and has 
more landscaping, more open space requirements. So it's more, it's more of a transition from business to residential than going straight from the very intense, most intense district, a commercial district, the central business um, B district, uh, straight to a, to a residential district. Another uh, set of changes has to do with the historic district. Um, this was done in consultation with the Historic District Commission. And there are, there are three um, spe specific area uh, changes and then one uh, more uh, nuanced change. Uh, the first one is, oops, sorry. Uh, the first one is um, on Islington Street. Right now, the historic district extends down to Dover and Union. And the proposal is to bring it down to the intersection of Bartlett Street and Jewel Court. So it brings it another uh, three or four blocks down uh, right to that major intersection. Uh, the second change is on Lafayette Road. Uh, right now, well, actually right now, the district comes down uh, Middle Street to the Middle Road, Lafayette Road intersection. And this would bring it down to down Lafayette Road, two blocks to the Lafayette School and the intersection of South Street. Um, the third one, there's a little donut hole or something up here at Hanover Street between Bridge Street and the Vaughn Mall, just a couple of lots uh, that um, the histor current historic district wraps around and, and we're proposing to uh, rezone or to include those in the historic district. And the final um, change is along Middle Street, right now it's a, it's a, a consistent distance back from, from the roadway that is included. So you have um, some, some lots on side streets that are, that get a back corner of their, of their lot included. Um, and and it, it doesn't necessarily uh, conform to what the historic district is intending to do in that area, which is to preserve the character of the houses facing the street. And so um, what is being proposed is that instead of having the, the consistent distance back that we use the lot lines, which is really how it's being used, you can actually tell from the map that on Islington Street, the lot lines are being used as the boundary of the historic district. And we're proposing to do the same thing along Middle Street. So these green areas, uh, they're a little in the backs of lots. These are all areas that would be taken out of the historic district. And then the pink areas, uh, and if you could see it more closely, you'd see uh, more of them, are areas that are parts of existing lots that extend beyond the current area. And we just look at the entire lot as the area to be included in the historic district. Um, at Osprey Landing, uh, this, there's currently an overlay district um, called the OR slash MV, Office Research slash Mariner's Village Overlay District. And it's, it's there because of a, uh, a settlement of a, of a court case um, a number of years ago. That, and the court case imposed some responsibilities on the city or the city assumed some responsibilities uh, with respect to making sure that the development had a certain mix of office and residential and ownership residential versus rental residential and affordable versus market rate. And basically that development has been pretty much built out. So the only things that are really from that, from that court settlement that are really still applicable are the mix of, res of ownership and rental units and the mix of um, affordable and market rate units. So what we're proposing to do is to make a, is, is to rezone that entire area to the underlying district. So the, off, the areas that, that are currently being developed as office park would be, developed, would be zoned as office research. The areas that are currently single residence would be zoned as for single residence and so forth. And we, we would be left essentially with a small area, and it's hard to see on this map, but it's this area uh, right in the middle there that would be the, the uh, remaining overlay district that only affects that, those uh, remaining uh, tenure and affordability requirements. One, another uh, referral that we have received from the, from the city council is the area um, that's essentially bounded by the, uh, the Route 1 bypass, uh, the railroad tracks, Bartlett Street, um, Kate Street, and uh, Cottage Street over in this area. And there's a, there's a request from property owners in that area to rezone from industrial to general business. And we're beginning to look at that. There are a lot of um, issues around that. Some of them are traffic issues. Some of them are environmental issues. Um, but we, it's not simply a question of which is the best zoning district. It's a question of how does this going to impact the wider areas. Can, can a rezoning actually reduce impacts for some of the neighbors who live on, on Cottage Street um, or affect traffic on uh, maybe Dennett or, or Maplewood, um, so forth. So, I'm sorry, Dennett or Woodbury. So, um, the, um, so we're, we're, we'll be looking at that. And there, then there are other rezoning requests that we've received over the past couple of years that, are, um, that we will be looking at also. 
And in, in the future, maybe not in, in this stage, but in the future, we want to look at um, the, the, some of the areas in the city where there are large numbers of non-conforming lots. There, we've, we've looked at the zoning, and um, in some neighborhoods, almost every lot doesn't conform to the existing zoning. The zoning was applied after the area was uh, developed. The, maybe the lot, the lot sizes in the zoning were increased. And so you have areas like um, uh, Elwyn Park and Maple Haven and Panaway Manor where a majority and sometimes all the units, all the lots are, no, are non-conforming. And this, uh, this, these maps are examples of an analysis that we did where we were looking at the percent by which the lot area failed to meet the minimum lot size. And so you can see uh, down here off uh, Maple Haven off um, Lafayette Road, entire neighborhood that seems to be um, non-conforming. And, and then this is um, the Elwyn Park area up here, so same type of thing. So we're going to be looking at that and trying to come up with, uh, I think, look neighborhood by neighborhood to make sure the zoning is context sensitive, that, that, it, that it really reflects each individual neighborhood. And Atlantic Heights is a, is a key example of, of the kind of neighborhood that it's kind of shoehorned into a zoning or as a particular zoning district. And if we can make it, uh, the zoning fit the neighborhood, uh, that would be what we'd like to do. In terms of implementation, um, the city council needs to adopt the zoning ordinance. Uh, it needs to amend the planning board ordinance in, with respect to city council referrals. And it needs to amend the site plan review ordinance to bring in three and four unit uh, buildings into the, uh, into the site plan review. And the planning board itself adopts the site plan review regulations. And the process going forward, we've, we've got the draft land, regu land use regulations on the city's website. Um, I know some people were having problems downloading, but uh, I think that maybe they were, they were going to the existing ordinance rather than the proposed ordinance, because the existing ordinance is a huge document. The, the proposed ordinance is, is much smaller in terms of file size. But the website, you can go right to the planning department website, and actually you can link to it right from the front page of the city's website now. Uh, so you can download those regulations. You can actually submit the comments online. We have an online comment form on that page to, to submit any comments, as well as telephone number, email address, and so forth. Um, in terms of the planning board completing its process, uh, this is the next to last uh, public hearing, the last one. The fourth and last one is, is scheduled for September 10th. Um, then the planning board will review comments and decide what changes to incorporate in the draft ordinance before recommending it to the city council. And we're aiming for October 13th as the date that we would present it to the city council. And then from there on, it's up to the city council with this public hearing process and uh, its vote on adoption. Um, I've handed out, as I mentioned, uh, the comments that we've received at the first two public hearings. Uh, these are not, uh, don't want you to be mistaken, these are not our proposals. I've just recorded um, s straightforwardly what was said at those hearings. And some of them have to do with kind of format, like this first one. Uh, somebody new to the ordinance said, you know, I don't know what these zoning districts mean, because you just include a, a brief statement of what each district, what the intent of each district is. And that seems like a, a, um, a fairly uh, reasonable request and something we'd like to look at. Um, there was a, at the last um, hearing, somebody who lives in the apartment district was, fit, was feeling like this was an area that uh, a lot of problems were occurring because of absentee landlords and, and neglect of properties. And so uh, consider, she suggested uh, designating our apartment districts in other areas of the city. Um, several people have, have recommended um, expanding the gateway district to include other areas besides Lafayette Road. And that's something we could, we could look at as well, maybe, maybe in the first phase, maybe in, a, in the second phase later on. Um, uh, the uh, recommendation or request has been made to allow expansion of existing residences in the waterfront business district where they're not currently allowed, um, to allow limited business districts in, in residential districts like a neighborhood corner store. Um, a recommendation was made to encourage compact develop more compact development by changing the dimensional regulations in the residential districts. A lot of comments about the continuing care retirement community, but they could really be grouped into, um, I think, two categories. One is removing the site requirements uh, that I mentioned before, the 35-acre minimum and the half-mile um, radius from the hospital. And uh, I would note that in, when the proponents came in originally back in December 2006, I think it was 2006 or 2007, uh, they proposed a five-acre minimum site area and a one-mile radius from the hospital. So somewhere in between there may be some, some room to look at changes there. And then another one, particularly from people who are immediate abutters on Islington Street, was a um, request to remove the requirement for two separate accesses to it, so you only allow one public access. 
and, not, and specifically not to allow public access onto Islington Street. Um, one issue where I'm, I'm sure that uh, you know, this is an example of how you have to be very careful in how you, how you uh, make these changes. Um, it was brought to our attention a couple weeks ago that um, in terms of motor vehicle sales, that we had made some changes from the existing regulations that were that made um, more of the existing dealerships in the city non-conforming. Probably about half of the dealerships in the city are non-conforming right now, um, and this would almost take almost all of the rest of them, make them, them non-conforming. What we had done is we had, in the process of discussing this, expanded the uh, required setback between a, a motor vehicle sales use in a residential district, and also had changed the wording so that it was a separation from a district of a di from a, a use on a lot from a district rather than the use itself from a district, which compounded things. You'd have to look at a map to understand what it, what it means. But I think that there's a there's a valid point here, and we will definitely look at this and uh, and perhaps re make a recommendation to move back toward the existing regulation. Um, there was recommendations uh, made to repeal all local wetlands regulations in the city and to follow state wetlands regulations, which uh, is a fairly strong recommendation. Um, and uh, to not include any man-made wetlands as jurisdictional areas. And then there were concerns about signs. What can be better done, done to better define sign so we don't have the repetition of the confusion that we've had recently about what is a sign? And uh, a recommendation or request was made to consider prohibiting all internal illumination of signs. Right now we're prohibiting them in the historic district and we're proposing to expand that somewhat, but the recommendation was made to, uh, or the request was made to consider prohibiting all internal illumination. So that is a summary of the, uh, the ordinance, and I am going to move this uh, podium back to the front so that people can come up and make comments. Um, and we'd like to uh, take public comments. I, I guess I'd just like to follow up on um, one little piece of um, what Rick mentioned, um, which is the purpose of this evening is to take public comments, um, public input, um, but we won't be responding to questions um, or, you know, reviewing um, issues. Um, as he mentioned, I think that that will happen at kind of the end of the process, which will be, I think we're going to talk this evening later on about our schedule, but probably in September, maybe at the September 10th meeting, um, we'll begin discussing um, reviewing all of the comments that we've received um, and what kind of changes we are interested in trying to implement. So um, when you come to the podium, please state your name and address. <laughs> John Grossman, 170 Mechanic Street, representing the Portsmouth Advocates. I have not read all 250 pages, as you can well imagine. <laughs> Our interest is particularly in Section 10.630, the Historic District. Uh, let me say one thing. I'm not sure if it was left out intentionally, but if you look at the current zoning ordinance and uh, Article 10, there are a lot of notes that are associated with the ordinance that affect different parts of it and are help describe what is meant. I hope these notes will be implemented again. In fact, last night the HDC used one of them when trying to decide a case. So the, the notes that were in there in the past are important, and such as in 10.631.30, it says within the historic district, uh, in each instance, the appropriate level of review shall be based upon the scope of proposed activities. Wow. <laughs> I could take that and make it this way or make it that or make it spread it out. That's one that I would think would need a note to sort of explain what is meant by that. By the way, I thought this was very well done and I congratulate everybody who was involved in it. Uh, I'm not quite sure, maybe it's my reading it. It's under the um, exemptions for certificate approval and item seven is mechanical equipment or ventilation terminators. Uh, when the volume or mass of an injured device does not exceed 27 cubic feet or extend more than four feet above the roof plane or extend more than one foot out from the roof plane. And I guess at some point I'll 
approach Cindy or somebody individually or Rick and find out, it seems to me you're saying a roof plane is here and you can bring out AC equipment like this. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. Um, one thing that I think is important, the application contents, I'm looking at paragraph 10.634.21, and it says everything that should be done, which was very well done, <clears throat> except it does not include that a plan has to have dimensions. And I say that because in prior meetings we've had, and this is not for small projects necessarily, but it includes both small projects and large projects, that dimensions haven't been included. In fact, I may be wrong, and uh, David, maybe you can correct me, but I think the very last minute we realized that the Eagle project, Eagle Photoshop project, didn't have a full set of dimensions on it, and they had to postpone it for a week or a month until it came back with dimensions. So I think it's very important to cite that dimensions be included in the plans. Okay, this one I feel, or we feel, I should say, very, very strongly about. And I'm on work sessions, and I'm on sections 10.635.23. There is no requirement to notify abutters of a work session. I think that is 100% wrong. In today's world, many of us like me don't necessarily get the newspaper. In today's world, how would I know if my neighbor was going to build a 10-foot fence? How would I know if something was going to happen and there was going to be a work session? And what happens with work sessions when they come before the HDC and you have one work session, and then two work sessions, and then three work sessions? All of a sudden, the HDC members take ownership of this project. They're human, what can I say? And especially when you get into 100 Market Street and you have a year and a half of work sessions. And if the abutter doesn't know to be at a work session, they won't know anything about the project until it's coming up for approval. Now it comes up in front of the HTC for approval. The members of the HTC have sat there and gone through these work sessions. They've recommended improvements. They've recommended changes. They've recommended different things. And the contract or the um, architect or the owner have helped out and they've made these changes and everything is looking really fine. And now I, as an abutter, finally hear about it. And I come in and I'm coming in and I'm fighting an uphill battle. I think it's absolutely wrong not to let no, uh, butters know about work sessions. They are important. Now, I understand it's expensive to send out for every work session. I don't know if you could send out and say, this is the beginning of work sessions for this project, and people then are responsible for following it on the uh, government work on the city website, whatever. But somehow, a butters need to know about work sessions. Interestingly enough, over in section 10.63550, notices, it says, notices of public hearings and work sessions shall provide the, serve the following information. So it is there. It's recognized that somebody's supposed to be getting this information. Also in that section, uh, under notices, it says, a brief description of work using one or more of the following statements, and it lists the following statements. One thing it doesn't list is what happens if a project, i.e. Pier 2, i.e. Port Walk, <coughs> has been approved, and now they're coming back for adjustments. <coughs> and there's no, nothing here that says that they have to be notified or have prior approval of adjustments. Somehow, again, abutters need to know it and it has to be included in the uh, city's uh, work site that they're coming back for adjustments. 
If you go down the review factors, paragraph 10, 635.60, number four, it says, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it says importance relative to the recognized individual or event. Again, that's not very clear. If you look at the old um, set of zoning uh, ordinance and you look at paragraph, it says it's got a footnote number three, it explains it what it means. So that's why I say the footnotes are important. This doesn't concern me, but it should, I guess you need to look at it. We're talking about time period for review, and it says 30 days, and I, I didn't work it out to say, gee, if, is 30 days enough time, but it seems like when the HTC docket is filled and then it goes on for another week, you might be very tight. Uh, I found an interesting in appeals in section 10, 636.52, that you say no ground set forth in an application of the commission for rehearing shall be the consideration by the considered under shall be given consideration by the board of adjustment or a court unless the court for good cause shows it allows the applicant to specify additional grounds. Are you saying as a city you can tell the court what to do? I found that just a, it doesn't affect me, but it's very interesting that you had that in there. Uh, then I went through and I found all the little things that affected the HDC, and there was one that's been around and I'm sure there's a good reason for it. I'm not quite sure why. I'm in section 10.1274.10 about signage, a wall sign greater than 10 square feet in area shall be at least two thirds as wide as the building frontage of the structure. I realize that's not new, but uh, it seems like, it, again, there should be a footnote as to how, whether two thirds is appropriate or whether it fits the building, depends upon the windows, depends upon everything else. And just to say two-thirds, has to fit two-thirds across, I found a little unusual. Um, I think that's it. Again, congratulations. I love the gateway. Uh, as you know, the advocates have fought for things that have happened on the gateway. And uh, we strongly believe that they should be protected when coming into the city. Um, I, if anyone's interested, I've taken these sections that affect the HDC and they've been extracted. Instead of picking up the entire 265 page document, if you go to portsmouthadvocates.org, you can drop down a PDF of just those items that affect overlay districts and affect the HDC. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Good evening. Ralph DiBonato, 1374 Islington Street. I'm here tonight to speak for my wife, Linda, and I. Uh, I will be brief with my first comment because it's uh, related to the comments I made last week. Uh, we do want to state again uh, our objection to the paragraph 10.734.53 in the continuing care retirement community section uh, that specifies two separate travel paths. In as much as the planning department wrote this document and the planning board approved it and sent it forward, uh, it, it's obvious to us it was written to accommodate the proposed development between Islington and Borthwick Avenue. Uh, I, I think that's easy to see. Uh, our concern, as we have stated before, is that, that the way this is written, it will lead to a permanent full entrance on Islington Street. And, and I want to caution the board at least to look at it from a different perspective. This rigid requirement could derail a good project. If other boards of the city council did not approve one of the two accesses for safety and traffic impact reasons, uh, it could be the end of a good project. If you gave some leeway and allowed one of those accesses to be for emergency use or opened in the event that the other access were closed because of a train derailment or, or that nature, 
then it would it could be functional and I think you should look at that um, and that's my final comment on that issue before this board having <laughs> having the document in my hand I came upon something else that concerns us uh, we had the experience of having a small single-family house next door to us sold to a single individual who proceeded to rent out three rooms and at the time this happened we found that there were no regulations as least as I was told by the officials at City Hall that <coughs> could help us with any relief this came with a serious packing issue uh, we live on Upper Islington Street where the lots are 50 by 100 and the houses cover 20 percent of the lot and most most residents in that little part of the neighborhood don't even have two off street parking unless they're one behind the other um, um, it corrected itself in time because the occupancy changed but it got me looking at at this document and I ran into something that I think needs correction uh, when I went looking for this what I found was a definition in the definitions of boarding house your definition of boarding house is the definition of a rooming house in every dictionary I looked in a boarding house in the dictionary is described as a place that rents rooms and provides meals a rooming house is defined in most dictionaries as a place that rents rooms you've defined a rooming house under the title boarding house and when you read that paragraph it says see also rooming house you have no rooming house reference in here unless it's hidden somewhere out of alphabetical order but it refers me to rooming house and there is none listed in your definitions uh, with that in mind and I think you should have a look at it uh, I don't know why we'd want to be in conflict with classic definitions in the dictionary but uh, what I believe I found and, and I know you're not going to help me out tonight so I may have to come to the planning office to, to find out if I'm correct it looks to me like anyone can rent out three rooms in their house and not come under any of the stipulations in here for boarding house or rooming house or whatever it should be I can tell you from experience that renting out three rooms doesn't mean three people one room can be occupied by two people that at one point produced somewhere between four and six cars in in a neighborhood that has no parking to accommodate it uh, it I, I was curious to if anyone of you maybe caught a piece presented on uh, 60 minutes uh, it actually was actually a couple of years ago but I found it very interesting because it relates to this they did a piece on a Midwestern town that was being uh, uh, unduly uh, uh, burdened by parents of college students buying single-family houses to house their child while they were in college because they found out that they could pay for it and actually make some money by having their student rent out rooms to additional students and what struck me at the time we saw this was the similarity physically between the pictures of this neighborhood in Elwyn Park here in Portsmouth it was an Elwyn Park neighborhood and they were there on a Saturday night when there were 150 kids for a college beer party at a house that had become a rooming house legally in that community I think something has I think renting out three rooms in a home is excessive particularly when there's no reference to how many people can be in that room as I read this thank you very much thank you for your comments Good evening, uh, Paul Mantle, 1490 Islington, Islington Street. Um, missing some board members tonight. It's kind of disconcerting. Um, all my comments are related to Section 10, Spot 730, the CCRC. Uh, I missed the past couple of meetings, but I do have some comments. And I'm going to categorize this in two separate ways. Um, whether or not the CCRC is site-specific let's say it is Let, you know and 
I'm using that based on Rick's original presentation, you know, and the comments by the board members, you know, saying that this is the best we can do and we should embrace it. Um, if it is site specific, it violates the master plan, uh, specifically master plan LU 7.6, which calls for a comprehensive study of this particular parcel. This study has not been done. And if you include this, you have two city documents, two city working documents, which are in conflict with each other. Um, as commented by the last meeting, if it is site specific, then this, uh, this section is the definition of spot zoning. Okay, it guarantees the developers a massive developer profit. Um, and I would think that one of the most prominent land use attorneys, Bernie Pilich, in this town, saying it's spot zoning would carry some weight. Um, but I didn't see that included in any of the comments about the CCRC. And finally, if it is spots, if it is site specific, including this, I believe, sets a dangerous precedent for the city. Because you're basically legalizing spot zoning. Any developer who doesn't get his way could easily sue and use this as the you know, basis of the suit, because you've done it before. Well, let's take a step back. Let's say it isn't site specific, because Rick Tainer said in his presentation, it wasn't site specific. It applies to a number of parcels in the city. Okay. It's still an included use in the office research zoning. It's not a housing project. It's not a residential project. It's an office research use, which means, in essence, it's another form of medical facility, albeit a age and economically exclusive medical facility, but it's not anything else other than a medical facility. You're tying it to the hospital. In that vein, um, section 10, spot 733, spot 30, access. The access should be the same as everything else in the office research district, especially when you're tying it to that particular hospital. You've even made it a con you know, uh, stipulation. It has to be a half mile from the hospital. It's right next to Jackson Gray, or shouldn't be that, should be, shouldn't be site, site specific, but it should have the same access as every other facility in that, you know, with that zoning. And it shouldn't impact any surrounding residential facilities. I mean, it's, it's just unheard of. Um, and going back to your, you know, the section that Ralph mentioned, 10734.53, two access points. I agree, there should be two access points. Still shouldn't impact any residential facility. You could have two access points on Borthwick Avenue. Granted, you know, if you have a graded rail facility, that may be impacted by the rail. You could have a overpass the rail facility which wouldn't be impacted by any disaster on the train. You could have an access point on WBBX Road and continue WBBX Road all the way to Borthwick Avenue and close it from Islington Street. I mean, the majority of the people who live on Islington Street have no problem with anything going on there. We knew something was going to go there eventually. We have a problem with anybody accessing it from our neighborhood. We've got enough problems as it is. Um, under Section... 10735, conditional use permit criteria. You have a item spot 40, which is the set aside for community purposes. Included uh, senior uh, facility, recreational facility, or a rail facility with land for building and parking. I would stipulate you would need at least five acres to accomplish any of that, and that set aside should be deeded back to the city. Why would you have uh, a conditional use if the set as, if it was the land it was built on was still owned privately? Um, the parking alone would be take four acres of that, especially if it's a rail facility. If the line ever comes back in use, 
you're looking at the same size parking lot as you would have for C and J. So anything less than five acres, you know, you won't be able to do anything with it. Um, at the bottom of the conditional use permit criteria, I would add, add the stipulation, because this is not site specific once again, that the CCRC overlay does not apply to the 41 acres between Borthwick and Islington Street. Because if it did apply, once again, you're violating the master plan, LU 7.6. The comprehensive study has not been done. And a final note, since it's not site specific, I would add that adding section 10.730 CCRC to be included into the draft zoning, the big document, was improper. And the reason I say that is because the vote was improper. Uh, Mr. Coker had to recuse himself. Why? It wasn't site specific. There was no, it had nothing to do with anybody in the audience. It wasn't site specific. So there was no reason for the recusal. Therefore, the vote to get it into this big document was improper. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else interested in commenting, sharing thoughts about the uh, draft zoning ordinance? No. Second time. <laughs> well, we appreciate the input this evening. Yeah. Um, and just in case somebody's out there in the hallway, because I did hear voices at a point, um, you know, in case there are any other second-time speakers or people out in the hallway who want to come up, please feel free. Um, and also, as uh, Rick Tainter mentioned, we're taking input um, via the website, cityofportsmouth.com, too. So keep that in mind. And yes. before we um, close, uh, or maybe you want to close the public here, but we did, I did want to talk about the schedule of meetings. Right. Go ahead. Right. Yes. Thank you for the reminder. Yeah, so I think it looks like since we don't have um, new or second time speakers, we can close the public hearing and um, try to discuss next steps in terms of um, the process um, for completing the zoning ordinance revision. And I think that uh, since you don't have a quorum, you can't actually make a decision on this. Yeah. <laughs> do, you have a, do you have a quorum? No, we have five. Oh, you have a quorum. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Um, so uh, we had recommended, <laughs> if I could just look over yeah. my shoulder, uh, we'd recommended a series of meetings to uh, try to take us through to get to the point of actually completing this process by the 13th. Um, what we're trying to do is get get this to the um, uh, the council by their, I think it's October 19th. Or, Third, third, uh, you're right. By the, 19th, by the meeting of the 19th, so we need to get to them on the 13th. And that gives them um, basically two months to, to complete their process. So uh, and we're hoping that they'll be able to do that before the end of the calendar year. Um, and so in order to do that, unfortunately, we have to ask you to give up some more th Thursday nights. <laughs> um, so we have a, our last public hearing uh, is uh, currently scheduled for the 10th. We have our regular meeting on the 17th. And so we're actually suggesting that the next three Thursdays be held aside uh, for discussion of this. And what we would do is we would, after the 10th, we would prepare uh, a comment sheet. We'd take the, uh, the sheet that we already have, expand this, add some comments from the staff on it. Uh, we've been making some notes about uh, some details, uh, like typos, and for example, the point about the rooming house, um, I'm that, glad that was brought up because that was a leftover cross-reference. We used to have rooming house in, in this draft and we had taken it out. So uh, that's the type of thing we would, we would uh, fix. Um, the the, the uh, October 1st may not be needed, but we'd like to hold it just in case we need to have uh, another meeting for discussion. And then on the, we would hope that on the 8th we could have a special meeting to vote on the final draft that you would submit to the City Council. Great. So the next public hearing, just a reminder, would be September 10th um, on this draft revised zoning ordinance. So um, if you have other comments that you'd like to share in the uh, public hearing context, um, put, please put that on your calendar. 
um, and the next regular meeting of the planning board will be uh, September 17th. So, yes, Tony. If it's appropriate, can we, um, can I request from the city staff, uh, I don't know, but report back, but on um, Mr. DiBernardo's uh, question about the number of people allowed to live in a unit, what, what the um, city attorney and staff believes is required? Because, I, I mean, I think you raised a good point, and, and I don't know if it's appropriate now to bring it up, but I'd like to find out what, what's allowed. We, we can certainly look into it. I'm not sure I'll be able to get to you immediately. No, no. We can try to get that uh, information. Um, I think part of it is, you know, some of it is uh, the definition of family, you know, that, that you can have up to five unrelated people living in a house just by, just by law. Um, so it's a, there's that, there's that part, but I guess the question that about state law or I believe that's a, that's Durham a kind of, has no more than three unrelated. Well, maybe, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe that is our city, city law, but I'm not really sure. It's, just, it's a well, common measure. So, I, I mean, what I would suggest, Tony, is since that was a comment made at the public hearing, just like all the other comments, we'll comment back on that because it, if anything, I think we've actually reined in where boarding houses, boarding houses are allowed in town. So, um, but yeah. good, good issue. We'll, we'll take a look at it uh, in a I, little bit broader way than Ralph brought up, which was the definition of rooming house, but his bigger issue. Yeah. And I think just for clarification, <coughs> I hope it's clarification. I hope it's not mm -hmm. a mistake. But um, the city adopted a separate ordinance, which is, is that a boarding house or a rooming house ordinance? I'm not sure. But we, we had to, we, that was a separate ordinance to deal with a specific issue, and we wanted to make sure that we weren't in conflict with that city ordinance. And that's so not the it, question I'm bringing up. That's a separate issue. Oh, I know, I know. Okay. Okay. That was, that was the, the, Cindy had just mentioned that one, too. Thank you. Okay. All set. Any other comments, thoughts? Okay. Great. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>